Hello, students. For today's history debate, we're going to be talking about meatpacking plants. Before we get started, I'd like to go ahead and apologize to anyone who has eaten a uh, pork product in the last day or so. To get started, we're going to look at this cartoon from Puck Magazine titled Watch the Professor. What do we see happening here? What is the professor putting in through packing town? Who is the professor? What's that say on his sash? Beef trust? Remember that we've talked about trust as really large industries or companies. What's going in to packing town? I wonder what packing town is. Is that where the meat packing plants are? What's coming out of Packing Town? Pure meat products. What seems to be the concern in 1906 about what the meat packing companies were doing to make their products? How might that be similar to a concern some people have today? After you've created a question about the document, we'll move on to studying our Contemporary debate, our compelling policy question for this is, who is responsible for making sure the nation's meat supply is safe? We're going to talk about a new change to the USDA. The USDA is offering meatpacking plants. We're going to listen to an article about that change, and you're going to complete the following chart. So first, we're looking for who is in charge of inspecting the plants and then we're gonna find out what change is being offered to them. The way the federal government oversees pork production is changing. Rules announced today pave the way for fewer federal inspectors in hog slaughterhouses and more company employees doing those inspections. Oh, okay. So what did we just find out about who's in charge? It said the USDA, right? So the USDA is part of the government? So is the United States government in charge of inspecting them? What change did the article just say is being offered to these companies? The way the federal government oversees pork production is changing. Rules announced today pave the way for fewer federal inspectors in hog slaughterhouses and more company employees doing those inspections. The U.S. Department of Agriculture calls this modernization. So there's going to be fewer government inspectors. Who is going to be replacing them? Employees of the company? We need to find out why we're going to offer these pork processing companies to be in charge and participate in the inspections. As NPR's Dan Charles reports, critics see it differently as privatization. A big pork processing plant is like an assembly line in reverse. A whole pig gets cut up into parts. And at various points along this disassembly line, by law, there have to be inspectors from the federal government watching for any sign of contamination or disease. They reject live animals that seem sick or sections of carcass that don't look right. So again, this is who inspects the plants. Federal government. Casey Gallimore's been in some of these plants. She's director of regulatory and scientific affairs at the North American Meat Institute, which represents meat companies. A really big plant has seven inspectors on the line, she says. You're going to have three inspectors that are looking at the heads, three inspectors that are looking at what we call the viscera, which is all the internal organs. And then you'll have one inspector that's looking at the carcass itself. But now the USDA is shaking up that system. Under a new rule that's been in the works for 20 years, but finalized today, pork companies have a new option. They can hire their own people to help out. These company employees would be at each inspection station. They'd weed out the problematic pork before the USDA inspector gives it a final okay. And there will be fewer USDA inspectors in the plant because they won't have as much to do. Okay, so again, what's the change that's being offered? Company employees are going to be able to participate in the inspections. This will mean there's fewer USDA inspectors. 
Let's find out why some people would support that. First reason is right here. Also under this new system, pork companies will be allowed to run their processing plants faster. Gallimore says the- Why would the companies want to have fewer inspectors? Fewer inspectors, they can run their plants faster. And if they can run their plants faster, what can they make more of? That's the idea. It's always great to have options. She says this will let plants try some new things, maybe operate more efficiently. She says it won't affect food safety because USDA inspectors still will look at every piece of pork that goes into the food supply. There's still three online inspectors that are there all of the time, and there's going to be two offline inspectors walking around all of the time. Five big pork plants have been experimenting with this system for the past 20 years, but there's been a lot of opposition to expanding it, from some USDA food safety inspectors, also from food safety activists. For instance, Patty Lavera, a food industry critic with the nonprofit group Food and Water Watch. We call it privatizing inspection. Lavera says you can't expect company employees to be as aggressive as independent government employees when it comes to spotting problems, because problems cost money. And to ask company employees to be under that pressure of pulling product out and costing their employer money is a lot to ask. And we think consumers are better served when we have an independent government employee making that call. And even though there still will be USDA inspectors in every plant, Lavera says there will be fewer of them, maybe 40% fewer trying to monitor carcasses that will be moving faster. So that just ups the pressure on that last USDA inspector kind of to be the last line of defense. As okay. So why do we learn in here as the reasons that people express concern about the pork companies being able to participate in the inspections? So we understand here why some people in the companies want to have fewer inspectors. That's because they can run their lines more quickly. Some people oppose this because they care about the safety of the meat products. They're worried with fewer inspectors, the meat will become less safe. But why would some taxpayers want fewer government inspectors at the plants? Who do those inspectors work for? So if those inspectors are paid by the government, if we have fewer inspectors, guess who's saving money? All right. So with what you know about the debate so far, we're going to try and find out whether or not we should allow them to help participate in the inspections. Listen to the rest of the article real quick. I'm doing things along the way. Lavera says increasing the line speed also can make it more dangerous for workers in these plants. Gallimore, for her part, says companies have every incentive to put out safe products and also protect their workers. Injuries in meat plants, she says, are currently at an all-time low. The new rules take effect in two months. Plants will have several months to decide whether they'll adopt the new inspection system or stay with what they know. Dan Charles, NPR News. This is another interesting point. If the lines move more quickly, could it be more dangerous? Should you factor worker safety into your decision? All right, time for part two. Now we're going to research a related past policy case study. Because as we know, knowledge of the past is the key to understanding the present. History deals with the past, but this past is the history of the present. We're going to be talking about the beverage amendment to House Resolution 18,537, the Agriculture Bill. Before we do that, we're going to do a historic literature review. So what we're going to do is we're going to read a little piece of Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, from 1905. He was a socialist who visited Chicago's packing town area, provided him with stories to use the right, to write The Jungle. The book showed the unsanitary meatpacking process, but Sinclair's goal was to show how badly the workers were treated, not upset people about the food. As you read these passages, highlight anything you think would catch a reader's attention in 1905. Jurgis was amazed by all the products made out of the carcasses of animals. 
He found that each area of production was a separate little hell, all as bad as the floor where the animals were slaughtered. The workers in each area had their own unique problems related to their job. Each had evidence of them about on his own body. Generally, he had only to hold out his hand. Butchers and others who used knives rarely had the use of his thumb. It had been slashed till it was a mere lump of flesh. Workers at the fast-paced stamping machines rarely could work so fast without making a mistake and having part of his hand chopped off. The odor of the fertilizer man would scare a visitor a hundred yards away. Many of the men in the cooking rooms had fallen into the cooking vats, and when their bodies were fished out, there was nothing left. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days, till all but the bones of them had gone out to the world as Durham's pure beef lard. Beef lard. They didn't pay attention to what was cut up for sausage. Old sausage that had been rejected and sent back from Europe that was moldy and white, it would be dosed with borax and glycerin and dumped into the hoppers and made over again for home consumption. It was too dark in these storage places to see well, but a man could run his hand over these piles of meat and sweep off handfuls of dried dung of rats. The packers would put poisoned bread out for them. They would die and then the rats, bread, and meat would go into the hoppers together. So revisiting this paragraph, old sausage that had been rejected and sent back from Europe. So at this time, Europe had laws that were protecting the meat production in Europe. So if meat showed up in Europe from America, it was no longer consumable, that was dangerous, that was moldy, that was old, Europe would turn the ship around and have to come back to America. But rather than throw it away, apparently, the American packers took that rejected meat and just mixed it back in with the newer meat and put that into the sausage. So what was your reaction to the passages you highlighted above? What do you think the government should have done in response to was written in the jungle in 1905? Please explain your answer. I'm curious to know how many of you will put something along the lines of the government should inspect, the government should regulate the meatpacking plants, something like that. We're going to talk about the beverage amendment. The beverage amendment said meat and meat food products are an important source of the nation's food supply. It is important that consumers are protected by making sure meat and meat food products are healthy, not adulterated, properly labeled, and packaged. All regulation of animals and meat products will be done by the government to protect the health and welfare of consumers. So before this time, was anybody doing the inspections? Were there any regulations as to what could go into the meat? Evidently not. So now that is going to be done by the government. That's our most important part. Things that this include the inspection of meat and meat food products, examination of animals, examination of carcasses. We're going to supervise the labeling, marking, and container requirements. There's going to be sanitary inspections and regulation of slaughtering and packing establishments, rejection of adulterated meat or meat food products. Inspections of all slaughtering, meat canning, or similar establishments will be inspected to make sure they are sanitary. Unsanitary establishments' products will not be labeled, inspected, and passed. Prohibited acts. No person, form, or corporation may a. Slaughter animals to prepare anything to be sold for use as human food in any establishment not meeting the requirements of this law. c. Sell or transport any food that has not been inspected and passed. D. Adulter any food, causing the food to be adulterated or misbranded. So they can't do anything that's going to make their food anything that it isn't what it is. So if it says that there is beef in that can, there has to only be beef. There can't be other chemicals or anything like that. 
So what's really most important about the beverage amendment was just what we got out of this. All regulation of animals and meat products will be done by the government to protect the health and welfare of consumers. What is the United States government going to start doing? I'm not going to require you to tell me about the historic context because what you really need to know is that the book that you read excerpts of, The Jungle, was published. So before then, there had been concerns about what's going in the meat, the fact that it's not regulated. Before the late 1800s, people went to their local butcher to get their meat products. So somebody who lived in the same town, city, you knew the butcher. You had a good reason to trust the butcher. But what happens is with the growth of the railroads, with the technology of refrigerated railroad cars, meatpacking plants develop. So Chicago became a huge center of these meatpacking plants. So cows would be shipped from places like Kansas City up to Chicago. In Chicago, they'd be processed, and then they'd be sent out from Chicago. A huge industry develops in Chicago. Some people were concerned about it, but... As you found out, up until the early 1900s, there was no real inspection of American meatpacking plants. Then in 1905, Upton Sinclair publishes The Jungle, and as you can imagine, that caused people, including members of the government, to grow concerned. President Roosevelt sent Commissioner of Labor Charles P. Neer and James Bronson Reynolds to inspect the meatpacking plants. They told of the unsanitary and unsafe conditions. For our arguments on this assignment, we're just going to look at two different cartoons. The first one, under this supporting question, why do some people think regulation of meatpacking plants is the government's responsibility? This cartoon from the Saturday Globe newspaper, titled, A Nauseating Job, But It Must Be Done. So there's Roosevelt. He had given a speech to Congress. Let's focus on this. So who's this guy here? That's Teddy Roosevelt. What's behind Teddy Roosevelt? What buildings are those? What is Teddy Roosevelt holding in his hand? It's this rake. So Teddy Roosevelt is famous for having called a number of journalists who were investigating the problems of society as muckrakers. They were the people that were exposing the muck at the bottom of the barrel of society. They used a muckrake to turn up this muck and research and find out about all the problems in society. So Roosevelt is now using investigation, a government power, to do what? To clean up the meat scandal. Go back to the title. A nauseating job, but it must be done. If something has to be done in our country, who should we rely upon to do it? And why is this something the government should be concerned about? What's the main idea here? And then why would this relate to today's debate over removing government inspectors from meatpacking plants today? So clearly Section 1 is making a fairly reasonable argument for why the government should be in charge of these inspections. Section 2 is going to tell us why some people think inspections of a meatpacking plant are the meatpacking company's responsibility. We're going to look at this cartoon from William Allen Rogers titled, For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. And so in this cartoon, we've got a couple different characters. The right is the beef trust. You can see that on his cleaver here and that bull. On the left, we have the railroads. The man in the center, Joseph Cannon, most likely, would be a member of the government. 
why are these two industries happy about what the government has done for them? Let's talk about the one on the right. Why would the beef trust be happy with the government? What's the bag he's carrying, say? U.S. to pay $3 million for inspection. Okay, so the United States is concerned about the meatpacking plants, but we're going to be the ones to foot the bill for cleaning up those plants and making sure that they're producing products that are safe. Why should that responsibility fall on the taxpayer? Why should somebody who doesn't, say, eat pork want his tax money to go to inspect the meatpacking plants? You make the choice to eat meat. Should that be your decision to make, your responsibility? Who should be the one that it's responsible for making sure the meatpacking plants are clean? Why does it have to fall on the taxpayer? Shouldn't that just be the company's responsibility? So if in the past people didn't like the idea of the U.S. taxpayer footing the bill to make sure the meat is safe, how might that be related to today's debate? Why might some people still believe that the taxpayer should be let off the hook for making sure the meat is of good quality? Whose responsibility do they think the meat's safety should be? Okay, what do you think the past policymakers decided to do? Think back to what you read in the jungle, put yourself in their shoes. Do you think that they wouldn't mind spending government money to regulate those meatpacking plants? Do you think they were as grossed out as you were? They absolutely were. There was a huge uproar about the food production. So, the Beverage Amendment passed, which became known as the Meat Inspection Act. Since that time in 1906, there's been dozens of acts related to regulation on food production. So you should know for over a century, the United States government has been the one in charge of inspecting food. Is that a pretty significant consequence? For over a hundred years we've been doing this? One of the things that Sinclair was unhappy about was he originally wrote these books, not this book, not to gross you out about the sausage, but to make you feel bad for the workers and for you to support doing things to make the workers safer. That wasn't the reaction that people had. They were more upset about what they read about their food than what they read about the workers. Sinclair famously later commented, I aimed for the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. How similar is that to today's debate? In that article that I showed you, we were looking at the consequences of moving the line speed more quickly. We were more worried about the safety of our food rather than the safety of the workers. Are we all a little selfish in this way? So what's the similarity between the two policy debates? In both cases, we're talking about doing what for the meatpacking plants? Inspecting them? What was unique in the past policy? This was just inspection in general, right? Should the government inspect the meatpacking plants? What about today? We know that the government's still going to have some responsibility in the meatpacking plants, but who are they going to share the responsibility of the inspections with? The rest of the assignment is extra credit if you choose to attempt it. You are telling whether or not the USDA, USDA should allow pork processing companies to help inspect their meatpacking plants. Please let me know if you have any questions. Good luck.